these tribes, or not all of these people, um, came out of Egypt. Now, what we have is uh, sort of an, the archaeology that we have. We can see that there are various different tribes coming together um, to form these Hebrew people or the Israelite nation that we have. And not all were blood descendants of Jacob. And we can actually see this in the biblical witness itself. Um, if you remember, Moses' uh, father-in-law joins the Israelites and becomes sort of one with this Israelite nation. Now, the only thing maybe that an analogy that we can think of, because if you think about it, all these different tribes coming together, why would they want to say that they were slaves in Egypt? Why would they want to take on this history um, that seems, you know, seems to put them down? Well, if you think about it, we sort of have a similar thing that goes on in the United States. Um, anybody who comes to the United States, they have to learn the history of the United States and if you ask them, you know, when they do become an, a citizen about their history, they will claim the American history. They will claim that their fathers came over and uh, fought the Revolutionary War and all of these different things. So we can see sort of maybe an analogy between the way that these tribes were coming together and something that's happening even today, where people claim another uh, country's history and they claim it as their own and uh, even recite it to their children and recite it on into the next generations. Now, some other things that we need to look at are the actual sources that we have for the biblical witness. And um, you can see on your notes there, I give a, a URL. That URL has a far more complicated breakdown of where these sources came from and sort of the history of how they were put together and redacted together. But for our purposes, for the Exodus narratives, we only actually need to look at three sources that we have here. Um, we have the Yahweh source, the Eloist source, and the Priestly source. Now, the Yahweh source um, is actually one of the oldest sources that we have for Israelites' history. And um, we're not sure who this writer was. Um, it's an anonymous writer or actually maybe group of writers coming together to form this uh, narrative. And it was around the time of Solomon. And you have the date there on your handout. Um, and the reason that this uh, author is called the Yahweh source is because uh, continually throughout his narratives, he uses the a specific name or the proper name for God, um, which uh, is mostly, most often translated in Christian circles as Jehovah or Yahweh. Um, this actual name was unpronounceable to most of the Israelite people, um, or uh, actually later, the name actually did have a pronunciation but nobody actually ever used the pronunciation um, in, in any of their services. It was so sacred, this name, that nobody could pronounce the name. And as history went on, people forgot how to pronounce this name. And so we are actually left with what you see in your handout there. It's just four letters for the name of God. There are no vowels. And the reason we have um, the word Jehovah or Yahweh is that after these letters were lost, after these vowels were lost, um, someone decided to add vowels into them so that we could pronounce these. And they most often used the word Adonai, or Lord, the Hebrew word for Lord, and just used the vowels from that and put that into the, these four letters. And so we have Jehovah. Now, and so the Yahweh source, he, he uses um, Yahweh, the proper name for God, throughout his sources. And... Uh, where he got his um, sources from, or the place that he is writing from, the context in which he's writing, is the southern kingdom of Israel, in Judah. Uh, and he is sort of gathering all together these oral traditions from southern uh, Israel and putting them together into this 
what we call this J source. Now the next source is the Elois source. The Elois source, um, just like the Yahweh source, is named by the way that um, he names God. And the Elois just uses a generic name for God, Elohim. And you have that in your handout there as well in Hebrew. And so um, he is actually writing from the northern kingdom or the northern part of Israel. And his text actually comes um, sort of near the fall or around 720, 730 BCE. Um, and he's writing from that particular type of context. And he as well is bringing together all of these different oral traditions. And later on, the Yahwist and the Eloist source were actually put together into a single source. And some scholars call that the JE source. And that's the source that the priestly writer is using uh, when he puts together sort of the final narrative that we're going to be seeing for the, um, the Exodus narrative that we have. And so the priestly source is the usually considered the final redactor of um, these different narratives that we have here. And the priestly source, there's a lot of debate about when he was writing from. Um, some scholars think that he was writing during the time of uh, the Babylonian exile. Some people think it's before, some people think it's after. And so you have the range of dates there, a huge range of dates for when they think that the, um, that the priestly source is putting together this final narrative that we have. Uh, and the, the most convincing for me is that the priestly source was actually writing during the time of the Babylonian exile. And you have uh, these, in his writings, you have a lot of uh, covenantal theology inside of it that was developed during the Babylonian exile time. We, we see writings and other things of that nature that are occurring uh, during that time that are sort of included in the priestly source. Now the priestly source, really anybody can notice these in the text that we see. These are the boring parts uh, where the narrative just goes on and on about these different rituals that you need to do and it's very nuanced with the, thing, the particulars that you have to have and so you can see in the, the priestly source a lot of different um, uh, codes and priestly codes trying to set up for the Israel people, is Israelite people, when they come back out of exile, sort of a ritualistic society, a theocracy that they can have that is governed by this priestly, um, this priestly author, this priestly group of people. And so we can see in the priestly author's writings sort of this setting up of a new society based upon um, the priestly rule that we have. Now some other influences that we have on the Exodus narrative are sort of, um, well not sort of, but they are the Caesarean uh, vassal treaties that we have. And most of the actual treaties that we, we actually can see are um, from the, the Hittite people. We have some Assyrian, but most of them are from the, the Hittites. And you can actually see uh, on page, I'm not sure, it's the second to the last page or the last few pages of your handout, a Hittite um, treaty, a vassal treaty. And we're actually going to be looking at that a little bit later um, when we see the uh, correlation that we have between these treaties and what we see in the Exodus narrative. Now, just to give you a little bit of perspective, maps are always good for perspective. Uh, you can see that the, um, when the priestly covenant, this, this author here, or this scholar who's put together this map, believes that the uh, priestly covenant th theology came around the sixth century BCE, writing in the Babylonian exile um, in Babylon, and you can see some of the other treaties and the dates that we have for these Hittite treaties. So we can see Assyrian treaties were in the 8th and 7th century 